see that uh, my advisor, Dr. Williams, is uh, here with us. So uh, I think I'll start. How's that, uh, Dr. Williams? We're waiting on you. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Hewitt Tishomer. On behalf of the Seminarian Committee Council, welcome to this evening's uh, panel discussion. Our topic will be, how should Christians engage Judaism and the Hebrew Bible? We're very grateful that we are able to assemble a panel of uh, experts to help us navigate this question. Before I start introducing our participants, please allow me to share the news that one of our panelists, Dr. Kamionakowski, <clears throat> will not be joining us this evening. She took her second shot of the COVID vaccine recently and has been suffering from the after effects of it. Our thoughts are and the prayers are with her and the many others that have suffered from this deadly virus. So first off, we have Rabbi Jack Pascoff of Congregation Sha'arai Shomayim, a local congregation here in Lancaster. Rabbi Pascoff has also taught the introduction to Ju Judaism class here at Lancaster Theological Seminary. Today is Remembrance Day, Yom Hashah. This is a day when Jews remember the lives lost during the Holocaust. We are especially grateful for Rabbi Pascha for making himself available on such an important day. We also have our Dean of Seminary, the Reverend Dr. Vanessa Lovelins, Associate Professor, Professor of Old Testament Hebrew Bible and Vice President of Academic Affairs. Dean Lovelace was very instrumental in making this event happen. She was very encouraging when I first broached the idea to her a couple of months ago and helped with the logistics and the things that go into making such events. And trust me, there are a lot of things that happen in the background before such events come to fruition. Thank you, Dean Lovelace and the development team that worked on it. Our third expert is Dr. Greg Carey. Dr. Carey is professor of New Testament here at LTS. Over the last couple of years, there have been many occasions where I peppered Dr. Kerr with questions about Judaism and how the New Testament engaged with it in the Hebrew Bible. Dr. Kerry was always careful with his answers, but also very demanding of our obligation to not only ask the right questions, but also with how we even frame the questions. His often repeated words were, look at our history. He was finally so tired of my questions, he offered to engage with me and my classmates in deeper conversations outside of his classes. We not only took him up on this offer, but we made that offer into a seminary-wide event. Kind as always, Dr. Carey readily agreed with that suggestion, and here we are. Thank you, uh, Dr. Carey. I'll give each participant a couple of minutes for opening remarks. And then I'll start with my own questions. We'll invite our Zoom audience to ask questions in a little bit. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat if that is better for you. I'll ask one of my uh, SEC folks to read them for us as we see them. Rabbi Paskov, thank you again, and I'll start with you. Perhaps before we start with Christians, let me ask you a question. How do you engage the Hebrew Bible? Are there other writings or traditions you augment it with? I'm thinking of the Mishnah. Uh, so first of all, thank you for having me tonight. It's always good to be with the seminary community. I'm always grateful uh, for the opportunity to be involved here. Uh, and I do appreciate the sensitivity about Yom HaShoah and our Holocaust Memorial Day. Uh, I often say to Jews as well as to Christians, that for us, the Bible is the beginning of the story, but not the end of the story. If you ask Orthodox Jews in particular, they would actually tell you that there are two Torahs. They will talk about the written law and the oral law. Uh, whether it's at the seminary or teaching seventh graders in my synagogue, People who have studied with me uh, know my, my bullseye chart, uh, which has Torah at the core, 
but then a series of concentric circles working out from that as different generations come along. Uh, it comes from an orthodox perspective that says that Torah must be perfect because it's the product of God and God is perfect. So how could Torah be less than perfect? If there's something we don't understand, that's a human problem, that's not a divine problem. And so it challenges us to wrestle with the text. This wrestling involves uh, some of the most mundane things uh, and so obvious that we often overlook them. And then of course, it gets into much deeper matters. When we talk about the mundane, I always give the example of the commandment to leave a corner of our fields unharvested so the poor can come and glean in the fields. And I'll always say to students, what's wrong with that statement? And they scratch their heads and they dig for deep theological implications and I finally look at them and say, how big is a corner? Is it symbolic? Is it a single stock? Is it a quarter? When I say corner, some people hear quarter. Is it the biblical tithe? Uh, so we don't know the answer to that. It'll take that next generation of the Mishnah to say, well, there's a range uh, based on how good your yield was how good the yield was in general in the region. How many poor people are there? How far do I have to push myself to lose livelihood by giving to others? So there are these very practical questions that were left for us to try to answer. Now we also deal with much harder questions. In the book of Deuteronomy, we're told if you have a stubborn and rebellious child, take that child out to the city gates and literally stone him to death. That was never, ever done. Ever. The rabbis were so repulsed by that. But they couldn't just say, hey, God, you messed this one up. We're just going to take this one out. So they hyper define every term so that it becomes impossible to say a child is stubborn and rebellious. Then there are the, na the narrative sections. How do we deal with God telling Abraham to sacrifice his son? I used the word wrestling earlier. This goes back to the story of Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. We wrestle with everything and everyone and God is not excluded from that. We ask hard questions of the text. And one of the things I plead with members of my congregation who are brought up mostly in the United States, native English speakers, most Jews in this country have at least a minimal reading knowledge of Hebrew. They don't necessarily have the ability to sit down with a Hebrew text and analyze it. But whether it's with Jews or Christians, my plea is always at least understand that English, or perhaps in your case, Greek, was not the original language of the Bible. I don't expect everyone to go out and study Hebrew, but at least to understand that you're missing something by not knowing the original. You're missing some of the beautiful, delightful ambiguities You're missing nuance. You're missing things like this coming Saturday morning at my congregation's Torah study. We're going to be talking about the two of the four sons of Aaron, Nadav and Avihu. No one ever talks about what their names mean. Nadav means a volunteer. Avihu? He is my father. Who's the he? And so we have tons of material. There's a, a wonderful meme going around just since yesterday that half of my colleagues have picked up on. It has a, a little book this big. It says, this is the verse from the Torah. And then it shows a whole stack of pages and says, this is the commentary. 
So when we talk about engaging with the text, you have all these levels. I'll add one more comment and, uh, and then wrap up this, this piece. Um, I said that the Mishnah, the Gemara, the Talmud comes from, uh, originates within an orthodox framework. Coming out of my background as a reformed Jew, where Torah doesn't have to be perfect. Where I could say of Abraham, you know, you really messed up when you so readily agreed to take your son up on a mountain and sacrifice him there. So my folks look for guidance. They look for instruction, inspiration. I always plead with them. I don't expect among reformed Jews that your final answer about major life challenges will come from Torah. But I do hope that it will be one significant source of input as you approach different stages of your lives and different questions that come into play. So if I can just take one more minute to talk about a general, my general hope for you engaging with this. Um, I would say more than anything, curiosity and respect. And not the certainty that this must have come about and was intended from its origin to point towards Jesus at some later time. And I'll stop there for now and hopefully uh, be able to respond a little bit more later. Thank you, Rabbi. Dean, uh, maybe uh, a couple of the minutes for your opening remarks. Sure. Um, as an academic um, and as a Christian academic who is a scholar of what we call the uh, Hebrew Bible and the Academy and the Old Testament in Christianity, um, I first come to studying uh, these texts with a humility with an understanding that I am a Christian reading Jewish, part of the Jewish um, canon, part of the Jewish scripture. And so um, to recognize that um, as I'm studying this as an academic, that one acknowledge and recognize that I'm still a Christian approaching the text and that I'm also an academic approaching the text. And so, that in some ways gives me more flexibility and more um, tolerance, more um, critical approach to the text that can separate some of those Christian biases that I've inherited. Um, but I think at the same time gives me um, some freedom, um, but also again, that humility of recognizing that this is a living text that is part of a living community and that I have not learned these texts as part of that community and to understand certain nuances and certain readings and rhythms and rituals that come along with reading these as a living, breathing Jewish community. Um, so that's the first thing that I like to make sure that my students understand is that I'm, I'm still a practicing Christian reading Jewish texts and to acknowledge that. Um, the second thing as I, when I'm in the classroom is to explain that these are, as we would say, the Old Testament and the, and again, I'm gonna use the academic term Hebrew Bible here, are the same books, but they are in a different arrangement in terms of canonically um, so that there are different number of those books because um, some of those books have been uh, divided. Um, there was no first and second Kings or first and second Chronicles, uh, um, Ezra and Nehemiah, um, you know, that certain of these um, texts were single texts that then later Christians came and split up. And that's why we have more um, books than um, we do. But to also recognize that part of that uh, distinction in the number of texts comes in 
because there are those three divisions, the Torah, which uh, Rabbi Pastoff talked about as so very central and the first set of uh, scrolls to be recognized as authoritative and really central to uh, what it means to be part of this community um, of God. And so that the, you have the Torah um, and then you have um, the prophets, the former and the latter, you know, get what we call history uh, and prophets, major minor prophets. And then we have writings. And so not only do you have a canonical difference when we talk about arrangement, but it's a theological difference. Because uh, again, as uh, Rabbi Pascal was alluding to, you know, when we, in the book uh, Malachi, and it's because of trying to point towards Jesus coming um, as opposed to ending on Chronicles, which talks about that return, that, that expectation that God has not abandoned um, these exiles and that God is still with them and God is going to do a new thing as they pre prepare to return. And so it ends on this note of hope um, that I love about the book of Chronicles that is missed when it has read in the Old Testament order. Um, and I also like to emphasize that, again, that reading is different. When we think of the lectionary and that we have certain readings each week, that in Judaism, there is a very different rhythm of certain readings. And I'm sure Rabbi Paskoff can, will talk more about that rhythm of those re selected readings and which readings are selected when um, and why they're uh, read. And, um, and especially when we talk about the festival scrolls. Uh, when we talk about Ruth and the Song of Songs and Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Lamentations, that those are read at a specific time. We don't read those books in Christianity in the church at a specific time for a specific reason as um, certain um, holidays. Um, and so again, there's a different cyclical reading than we have in Christianity that I like to lift up. And, and I, think fi I think finally, <laughs> uh, I want to emphasize that the uh, when I keep talking about in the, ac the academy, the Hebrew Bible is an academic term. Um, whereas in Judaism, when we talk about the Torah, sometimes meaning the whole Tanakh, um, those three divisions I talked about. Um, and, but that it still doesn't end there. Um, and that those writings that there, there are Jewish scriptures, plural, um, that we've already mentioned, the Talmud and the Gemara and the Mishnah, um, and so on. And so that it, um, as a UCC uh, person, we like to say, you know, never put a comma, well, we've appropriated, where you never put a comma, or never put a period where God has put a comma, that there's just this continuity of interpretation and reading um, that doesn't end that it, it, at a particular end of a book, at the end of a canon. Um, and so um, I'd like to, that's what I emphasize when I'm teaching uh, in the uh, Old Testament Hebrew Bible in the classroom. Thank you, Dean. Uh, Dr. Carey? You're muted. Of course, I'm still muted. Um, thank you. It is so good to see all of you um, alums, some from a while ago, um, students and, and friends from the community. And I want to especially thank Rabbi Paskoff for coming. I'm sorry Tamar couldn't be here. She's an incredible colleague. I've had the chance to work with her a couple of times. So I, I want to start there. And um, maybe Peter Schmeekin won't be surprised to hear that I got in this hot water by being maybe a little bit firm on some points with students. So, um, but I am because it matters. And so we're on our secular calendar you know, still in Holocaust Remembrance Day and need to be attentive to a reality. Jews and Christians aren't going to agree on everything and that's fine. I mean, we certainly don't interpret Jesus in the same way, though some of the coolest stuff ever said about Jesus is said by Jewish scholars. Um, and the Apostle Paul, for example, is the only Pharisee whose writings survive from his lifetime. 
So we are talking about Jewish history when we talk about the New Testament. But um, at the same time, we have this history in all kinds of churches. I visit lots where preachers try to make Jesus sound good by making Judaism sound bad somehow. It's a pernicious habit. And that's what I'm passionate about with students if they not participate in that habit. Um, that they imagine Jack in the front row um, and, and think, you know, do I really know this? Do I need to say it? Is it true? Because the basic reality is few seminary graduates of any sem Christian seminary know much at all about Judaism or Jewish history. And so what happens is we repeat things we've heard all our lives and they are deadly. So my presentation is five of them. I didn't crib it from Amy Jill Levine's little essay, Bearing False Witness in the Jewish Annotated New Testament, but she was the second reader of my dissertation, so I got to be channeling something. But um, I, 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 I thought of five that I really try to make sure students are aware of. Um, the first lie you often hear is Jews are trying to earn their salvation by good works and Judaism doesn't have grace. Um, the quick answer to that is, have you read the Psalms, people? Uh, do you remember that when Adonai introduces the divine self to Moses, Moses learns that the divine self is full of mercy, right? Patient, slow to anger. So no, Christians didn't invent grace. Second, you'll hear people say that Judaism is ritualistic and formalistic and lacks spirituality. Well, of course it's ritualistic, every religion is. Even Baptists don't know they're ritualistic. Um, but listen to three offertory prayers in different Baptist churches and they will sound the same. Um, we, we do the same things over, over again in every tradition that has value, but to the idea that there's a mystical lack of mystical closeness to God in Judaism, as the deer pants for the water. It's as if we say those things without even having thought about them. Another one. Ancient Jews thought God blessed only them and were exclusive. You get to the 14th chapter of Genesis and Abraham is performing sacrifice with a priest who has nothing to do with Abraham's God. Um, the idea of righteousness among Gentiles is even recognized in parts of the New Testament that describe Gentile characters as considered righteous by synagogue communities. The fourth, that Jews somehow failed to recognize that Jesus was the Messiah, and in failing to recognize Jesus was the Messiah, they didn't understand their own Bible. Uh, this is a particularly deadly one. And I'll just say this, that as you read the gospels, there's nobody in the gospel stories that understands Jesus' messianic vocation during the story. And maybe the most important thing I would say about how we as Christians read the Jewish Bible is, and this applies to all of theology, there are real theologians in this room, and I will still stand and fight for what I'm about to say. Theology talks like it's a logic that works forward, but theology always is looking backward. In other words, it's like if someone we love dies and we go to the funeral, all of a sudden, as we're talking about that beloved person, things in their life make sense in a way they didn't while we were experiencing it. And so the first followers of Jesus were all would have identified as Jewish. And when they tried to interpret the experience of Jesus, they did what all other Jews did in the first century. They went to the scriptures 
read them in a different way because of their experience and integrated them into that experience. So no, there was no one who anticipated someone like Jesus because he didn't fit any script that existed in the world at that time. And it is the process of Christians making sense out of Jesus that caused that to work. Finally, you'll often hear Christians saying that somehow the law was oppressive among Jewish people. We could break this down into parts, but I just want to notice some things that Christian preachers make a lot of that the Gospels just don't say. For example, nobody complains that Jesus had women disciples. Jesus wasn't any better about women than a lot of other people were in the Jewish world or the ancient Mediterranean world. So nobody says, oh my God, he's talking to a woman. Nobody says, how could he touch a leper or touch the body of a dead girl? It never happens. In other words, throughout the Gospels, Jews are perfectly happy that people are receiving blessing and being included in ministry because all of that is there within their tradition. Yes, there are debates over how to interpret the Torah. Um, that was happening among Jews at the same time. It's not unique to Jesus. And so the idea that um, the Torah is somehow the problem that is keeping people who are, say, sick or um, are female from being included is simply a historical inaccuracy, a misrepresentation of Judaism. So in the end, I think we, when we're in the work of preaching and teaching in the life of the church, need to take account of two things. One is, let's really stick to things we know and understand, um, because few of us have studied this stuff much. And second, I'd like to invite people to imagine the possibility that good theology can celebrate all the blessings of Jesus without needing something to compare Jesus to in, in a negative way. How great is Jesus if you have to find somebody to say something bad about? Thank you, Dr. Carey. <clears throat> Robert Paskov, uh, most of us are surprised to find out that the Hebrew Bible is not a blow-by-blow -blow account of uh, a then uh, current uh, story or history. At LTS, we start by uh, actually drawing out the timeline on a piece of paper uh, to align the stories with the, you know, the uh, timeline of the, uh, you know, the uh, actual events. As a Christian, I would like to know, how should I deal with that? What should that mean to me, that the fact that those stories are not aligned with the then uh, others uh, uh, time? I, I often say to people, when we're trying to set a timeline, when we're asking the question, did it really happen? I will often say we're asking the wrong questions. Asking questions is critical in Jewish life. We are not, for the most part, people who say, well, it's written, that's the end of the story. We will say, it's written, but what does it mean? How do I apply it? Does it apply today the way it applied 2,000 years ago? What if it no longer fits my understanding of life? These are all fair questions in Judaism especially as a reform rabbi. I am little concerned with timelines and did it really happen? And by the way, most many Orthodox Jews will deny this. But if you go back about uh, 900 years to a guy named Maimonides, uh, also known as the Rambam, uh, Maimonides had the same views. Maimonides is a very controversial figure. But if you read one of Maimonides' great works called The Guide for the Perplexed, you're going to see that Maimonides says, you know, when it says God's arm, God's saw, God's breath, it's not really what it meant. 
Now, Maimonides was an elitist. So he would have said, that's what we're going to try to convince the, the masses of, because they, they can't understand the deeper implications. But for the rest of us, this is philosophy. This isn't history, uh, nor is it science. It is metaphor. It is symbolism. And we are to search for deeper meanings. Now, I mentioned Maimonides, who perhaps in his day was the ultimate rationalist. A little bit later, we get the mystics. An entire collection of mystical scholars st studying the body of Jewish life called Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. They're going to approach from a very different direction. They'll play with numbers, and I'll, I'll comment on that in a second. But they're also not suggesting that this is to be taken literally. Uh, one of the lines I use about both Judaism and sometimes an interfaith dialogue is that selective literacy is by definition hypocrisy. So the mystics and the rationalists are coming at the same text, drawing a similar conclusion in general, taking it in different directions. But it's not people saying this must be just as written. I mentioned before two Torahs, the written Torah and the oral Torah. The oral Torah is the mission of the Gemara, the Talmud. It was never intended to be written down. Now it's been written down for 1800 years. But it wasn't intended to be written down. It wasn't intended to be, if you will, carved in stone. It was intended to grow. So timelines, okay, you want to memorize all the begats? You know, let's face it, between Adam and Eve and Noah, the only one anyone pays any attention to is Methuselah. Okay? Um, so you want to memorize those lists? Fine. You get a sequence of stories. But I'm not looking to that for history or science. I'm looking for a way to live. Uh, the general term for Jewish law in Hebrew is halacha, which comes from the verb to walk. This is the way we go. And so I understand the importance for some of creating timelines and detailed outlines and the lists of begats. Uh, but even if Orthodox Jews are being fully honest, they're going to say that those things are not what's primary about how they read the text. I just Thank feel you, that I neglected Sorry. Enoch. <laughs> I spent a lot of time with Enoch. <laughs> um, but I, I, I know I wasn't invited to, but let's remember the Gospels aren't exactly chronicles of Jesus' life either. Um, and neither is Acts. And if we get stuck on that, um, we're, we're sort of misreading them too. I, I share everything that Jack said and would apply it across the canons. Well, since you, you already unmuted uh, uh, Dr. Carey, so what makes you cringe in your uh, New Testament classes, uh, especially coming from students? Um, those five things, really. I, I don't cringe when students think that the Hebrew prophets predicted Jesus. Um, I know why they think that. They've been told, told to think that. Um, and as I said a minute ago, you know, that's the product of Christians reading the prophets after the fact and reading them a different way, which is what we all do with our, with our sacred text. That so much doesn't bother me, but it does bother me um, when there are assumptions about Judaism that are negative and inaccurate, and they're used to, um, to make sense out of stories related to Jesus or to make sense out of Paul's letters. Um, and it becomes important then to sort of imagine that 
some of what I tried to do a minute ago was just remind folks, you already know this in a way, it's just that we forget it in certain contexts. Um, so we read the Psalms for forgiveness and celebration and mysticism, except when we're, except when we're, except when we're. And so those are the things that, that I worry about, to be honest. Is there one single thing that comes again and again with each class, either at the LTS or beyond? Um, I think ideas that um, Judaism was restrictive or in, um, or oppressive through, it, through its use of the Torah. I mean, the Torah certainly does have boundaries and every society has, has boundaries. But, um, it, you know, I just, I mentioned earlier, you know, stories where we say, can, can you believe it? Jesus is teaching a, a woman, but nobody in the story is surprised. Or, oh, Jesus healed a leper. Well, lepers are unclean. Yes, and everybody in the story is happy about it, right? It's not controversial. Um, in other words, we impose these things on stories where it's actually not part of the story. I think that would be the thing more than anything else for me. Thank you. Dean, uh, what do you struggle with when you teach uh, the Old Testament to uh, Christians? I would probably say that, um, respectfully, the, the literalism. Um, when you talk, when Christians talk about um, the inerrancy and infallibility of the Bible, because it's one, it's a modern concept. By modern, I mean like 19th, 20th century um, to read the Bible that way. Um, that the original fundamentalists um, in terms of understanding that text, when we talk about inerrancy and infallibility of the text, did not mean the received Bible, English language Bible we have today. They mean the original monograph, which no one has ever seen. It's never been recovered. We don't know if it will ever be recovered. So they're not talking about that the current Bible may or may not have some inaccuracies or errors, uh, scribal um, errors or so forth. Um, and so to let their parish or to, for that tradition to continue inaccurately um, that people think that it means the, the Bibles, the English uh, translations that they're reading in the pews and not the original monographs. Um, I think that um, is something that bothers me. Um, another would be um, kind of what uh, Rabbi Paskoff uh, mentioned earlier is the notion of uh, legal, that Judaism is legalism and that Torah is, means law. Uh, when it actually, it means instruction. Um, it, it is a direction, instruction for how do we live as the, these covenanted people with this deity that has claimed us and um, expects loyalty from us, expects um, uh, fidelity. And, and part of that means caring for the poor, caring for um, the widows, caring for those on the margins. Um, and so that it is a, um, I think it was it, uh, Brad who mentioned that um, the purpose of reading is not from reading, but from living, that this is in the living um, is the, the doing. Um, and so one needs direction, guidance, boundaries, et cetera. And that's what the Torah provides. And so um, the idea that it's, it's the, the law means it's a legalistic religion. Um, and then I think getting just kind of the, the, well, I can't blame them for reading chronologically and not recognizing that. No, this is not the big, you know, history from Genesis to Revelation of the whole history of the cosmos and the, um, um, humanity and so forth. Um, but that's another topic <laughs> or another time. Right. Uh, Jen, uh, Jen White, so may I ask you to uh, look at the chats and see if you find any questions you perhaps you, you'll share with us? Okay. Rabbi, I have a question about uh, 
Mishnah. Uh, you probably don't remember this, but uh, last year during our Old Testament class, you made a presentation for us. And you actually, uh, once I reached out to you, you pointed me to a number of uh, uh, stories and ideas that I should uh, follow up on. What is it that we miss out when we read the text uh, literally? You know, it's, it's hard to even say what literally means. Uh, and I'll give you an example from the Mishnah. There were two great sages who lived 2000 years ago. One was named Hillel. Uh, we know him better because he gets all the college uh, Jewish organizations named for him. There was another contemporary, Shammai. And we're told that Hillel and Shammai debated about everything. And when they were gone, their students debated and argued about everything. And one day it says that there was a, um, a heavenly voice. Right? Hillel students and Shammai students are arguing and there was a heavenly voice that said, both this one and that one are words of the living God. How can both be true? How can both the answers that come from the living God. For Jews, that's not a challenge. That's not a challenging notion to be able to say there are different ways of understanding, different ways of doing. Notice I didn't say different ways of believing, but that's almost secondary. One of my teachers, Rabbi Lawrence Kushner, tells a story about um, talking to a bunch of kids one day about believing in God. He, he asked little kids, how many of you believe in God? He thought if for no other reason than to please the authority figure, him in this case, that they would all raise their hands. He said, not one kid raised the hand. He was distraught. Where have we gotten to that kids are so already tainted that they don't get it? He kept talking, he was angry at these kids and their parents. And he finally said, how many of you have ever felt close to God? And the, student, the little kids not recognizing what was going on, every single one of them raised a hand. So it wasn't so much about believing, it was about feeling, it was about doing. It's about 30 different Jewish theologies that I can point you to, and that wouldn't exhaust them all. So both this one and that one are words of the living God. And I don't always have to arrive at a single answer. So that's, when I look at Mishnah, when I look at these texts, that's what I see. So it's not about a, a literalism. It's not about a single authoritative understanding. It's about debate within a certain context. Okay, Jen, uh, Jen, I think uh, you have a question. Okay, this one came from Dr. Williams asking Dr. Carey, how do you recommend we deal with this law grace dichotomy in the book of Galatians? So there are two books among Paul's letters that are specifically written to address the question of how people who are not Jewish can be part of this um, community, we would call it Christian anachronistically, can be part of the church without first converting to Judaism. And so he uses a very specific phrase. He doesn't say you're saved by grace rather than law. He says you're saved by grace rather than works of the law. He's specifically talking about will the men who are Gentiles undergo circumcision? No student has ever heard me say that without adding, without antibiotics. These are adults, right? <laughs> they get to choose. Uh, will they change their diets? Will they observe Sabbath? And Paul's argument is they have already encountered Christ so they don't have to convert to Judaism. They don't have to do works of the law because they've already experienced grace. Paul, and, and you know, we, we do this in the, in the uh, intro New Testament course. Paul 
never says anything about not doing good works. He believes people are judged according to their works, but it's works of the law as a standard for justification or inclusion. So um, that is a major point in contemporary New Testament scholarship and our students hear it a lot. And I'm aware that it runs counter to a lot of theologies, but I also think it's very healthy theologically. Thank you, Dr. Carey. Um, Jack, I have a question here for you and I'm gonna put a plug in here for all LTS students. If you have an opportunity to take the Judaism class with Rabbi Jack, please do that when it's offered again, um, because this conversation is just whetting your appetite for all the conversation that we have. So, and that's the plug to the school to say, keep having Jack around because it's so worthwhile. Um, so to the question that I posed is, how would you advise Christians to inform and educate their congregations about Judaism and the Hebrew Bible? I know we have a cross-section of cities, regions, states here, but I know very few rabbis who wouldn't welcome the opportunity to engage in meaningful, respectful, serious interfaith dialogue. Uh, the, the chance to educate, like I, when the call was beginning, I was saying to a few people, my course at the seminary used to be funded by an organization called the Jewish Chautauqua Society, uh, a Jewish organization that exists entirely to eliminate, reduce anti-Semitism through education. So many seminaries, many colleges, individual lectures, uh, they would facilitate that because that's the belief. The more people know about us, uh, the more they have an opportunity to understand, the less conflict we're going to find. So I would strongly recommend whether you live in Lancaster or elsewhere, seek out a rabbi locally, if that's at all possible. Uh, I will also say, and um, I'm always honored, Dr. Lovelace uh, joins us for Torah study sometimes on Saturday mornings. Uh, that's my favorite time of the week, by the way. Uh, and you are always welcome, whether it's with me or in a community uh, where you may be living. But come and hear how we argue and debate and talk and listen. Uh, one of the things I love most about uh, my Saturday mornings is uh, we have born Jews, Jews by choice, non-Jews. Uh, we have people of different races, different socioeconomic classes, different levels of education. Uh, but we all understand that we're engaging with this sacred text in a Jewish environment. Uh, and so I certainly invite all of you to join with us. Minimally, if that the opportunities don't exist to engage a local rabbi, uh, and maybe even more so for faith leaders to be able to say, this is an understanding that you may have been taught, but I'm here as your congregational leader, as your teacher, as an academic in a Christian institution to tell you that you've been exposed to one means of understanding and it might not speak for an authentic Jewish experience even if you're not equipped to, to dig in deeper, at least acknowledge that in front of your congregations on a regular basis, that there's more to the story than the way it's told typically in many Christian environments. Thank you. We have some more questions. I'm gonna go to Dean Lovelace next. And this is a question from President Rowe. What is the level of fidelity to the text or context that Jesus or the gospel writers exhibit? Can I ask Dr. Rowe to expand on what he meant by that? I read that, but I didn't understand the context. So uh, There are several times in the gospels where Jesus quotes scripture. And I'm wondering um, whether it's attributable to Jesus or the gospel writers. Uh, 
how good did they do? Did they did they use it appropriately, misappropriate it? How how is that evaluated from a scholarly standpoint? Uh, I'm going to ask um, Greg Carey to jump in here with me, but I mean, to a certain extent, um, where it is quoting the um, the Hebrew directly, um, it tends to be accurate. Um, you know, we just had the seven last words and some of the Psalms that Jesus is quoting. Um, it would be uh, accurate. Um, sometimes um, it's an Aramaic, and sometimes it is. Um, could be the Greek um, translation. I think that kind of gets more into when you get into the gospels that um, you're getting into the Greek and not Hebrew uh, translations of the, um, the writings. But um, in general, the, the quotes by the words attributed to Jesus and um, some of his followers um, in the Hebrew or Aramaic are um, scripturally accurate. Greg, do you want to also add to that since that's your area? Well, I, I would just say that everyone in, in the ancient Jewish world, the world that Jesus and Paul lived in, assumed the scriptures were speaking to their own moment. And so they, they could debate, as Rabbi Paskoff told us so well, they could understand those scriptures in a lot of different ways and argue about them. Um, when students ask, well, what did Jews think about X? I would say, well, what do Christians think about abortion? What, you know, I mean, it, it's, there's diversity in the ancient world. And, and so um, what's happening with Paul and with, with Jesus is the scriptures are being interpreted in creative and relevant ways. For example, you know, when Jesus says, you know, you've heard it said, you shall not murder, but I tell you, don't even call someone a fool. That's biblical interpretation. He's not trying, um, he's taking the idea of murder and saying, don't even do anything that diminishes a person's humanity. Um, he wouldn't have been the only Jew in the first century to make that kind of interpretive move. And I, I guess that's the way I'd put it. Rather than fidelity, like did they get it right? Um, I, I don't think it's so much that as they're reading the scriptures and applying them to the questions and the moments they're, they're living with. I would add to that, yes. Um, but one, yes, and one needs to understand that Jesus is citing certain passages from um, particularly the Torah or the prophets. Um, and, and so if you don't understand what he's saying, when you say thou shall not murder, well, that comes from the commandments or the, from, um, yeah, <laughs> not to forget that there are 613 commandments. We didn't get into that, <laughs> but, um, so or, or when, um, you know, Jesus is, um, you know, we're making reference to the Shema. Um, you know, and um, Deuteronomy 6 4, and, and in terms of um, help me, Greg, the, <laughs> um, you know, to love your neighbor as you love your neighbor, yourself. yeah, yeah. Um, and so, one in terms of that fidelity on one end, that Jesus is quoting um, the, the again, the Torah as he knows it, and the prophets as he knows them and has learned them, but then to your point he's interpreting them from a specific context. And when we talk about contextual learning and contextual education, Jesus was doing that <laughs> before we called it that in the academy. Can I add something on this note, please? Um, sure. And th this applies to, to any people who read scripture and take it seriously. Right? This is not a Jewish thing or a Christian thing. We like to extract bumper sticker slogans. Uh, we cherry pick what we like. And we want people to somehow believe that that's all it said. So I, I'm always fond of uh, Jesus saying, love God, love your neighbor, right? Um, Love your neighbors easy enough. It's a standalone 
an, an entire series of commandments in Leviticus 19. Love God comes in a very different context. Because what you get right after that is, and these are the commandments you need to observe to show your love for God. You're going to bind them as a sign on your hand and a symbol between your eyes. You're going to teach them faithfully to your children. You're going to mark the doorposts of your house. This is not about the emotion for Jews. This is not about the emotion of love. This is how we show them. So again, Jews do this also. Anytime we're cherry picking verses or sections of verses, we're getting into areas of I won't say distortion necessarily, but inaccuracies, perhaps, that are somewhat misleading. Uh, you know, what was said before and after? I often get into conversations with, um, uh, with some Christians who want to know, but what about Isaiah chapter 7? And one of the things I'll always answer is, well, what about Isaiah chapter 6? I don't know what Isaiah chapter six says. And you know, Jews are, are, are not so big on memory. But in other words, we're gonna focus in on one verse that supports the case we already want to make. In my congregation Torah study, I talk about the Martian test. If a being came down from outer space and read this text, without the, the theology that we begin with before we even read text as children, what does the text say in that case? And again, Jews do this, Christians do this. Sometimes we have to let the text speak for itself. And we don't always like doing that. We want proof texts. And I think that's a dangerous way to read scripture. Thank you, Rabbi. I have a, a, a two-part question. Uh, the first one goes to uh, Rabbi uh, Paskov and the second one to Dr. Carey. This was suggested by my advisor, Dr. Uh, Williams, so that, that means it was commanded by her since she uh, signs off on many things for me. <laughs> so what about the uh, Pharisees and the uh, scribes? How do Jews see them, uh, uh, Rabbi Paskov? And then I'll ask Dr. Carey, how should we see them and why do we find it convenient to actually have them as sort of the enemy of uh, the New Testament or the, uh, you know, the Jesus dialogue? Um, Dr. Carey, before you go there, if I can just say, as I read Christian scripture, I believe Christian scripture conflates the Sadducees and the Pharisees to arrive at an enemy. As I understand the Pharisees, the rabbinic tradition, and for that matter, Jesus, is more aligned with the Pharisees than anything else. Who is Jesus objecting to? He's objecting to the old guard aristocracy. As Jews read our history, those were the Sadducees. They weren't the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the ones who were dealing in proto-synagogues with proto-rabbis who were saying it's no longer about the way we've always done things. It's the way we're learning to do things now. So I consider myself as a, not as a rabbi, but as a rabbinic Jew to be a direct heir to the Pharisaic tradition. Dr. Carey, sorry to have gone on. Uh, you were on supposed to go first. Bit. You were supposed to go first and, <laughs> and I almost entirely agree. So um, I do think the New Testament does discriminate between the Pharisees and the Sadducees on a few points. It shows them arguing with each other over resurrection 
And the Pharisees are almost entirely absent in the drama leading up to Jesus' death. So there's a little bit there. But um, when I think about the conflicts that Jesus had with the Pharisees, I, I totally agree with Jack that Jesus probably did have debates with Pharisees because Baptists have debates with Pentecostals. Now, what, what I mean by that is, if you're close enough together, but you disagree on some important things, those are the people you argue with. And so they, what you see is the Pharisees will accuse Jesus of violating the Torah. And Jesus will say, no, I'm not violating the Torah. You don't understand the Torah. That's the kind of thing that happens in first century Judaism. It, it, it's not shocking. Um, now, there is another layer, I, I guess two. One is, as historians, we know a lot less about Pharisees than we wish we did. Um, the sources aren't contemporary. So what Christians have come to believe about them is shaped by the ways the Gospels describe them. And the Gospels are written long after the time of Jesus at a moment when there's conflict over, over Jewish identity and over the emergence of early Christian groups. So the gospels portray Pharisees as villains and you just heard Jack say, to me, they're my spiritual ancestors. They were the progressives among the various groups of sectarian leaders in first century Judaism. Um, that's not how the gospels portray them. And that's sort of a big obstacle in historical understanding of the Gospels for a lot of Christians. Um, I guess I'm going on. I don't mean to. I'll just say this. Uh, Bill Adams is here. He knows how liberal I am. But I can't stand to watch MSNBC for long. Because MSNBC is going to be taking the worst possible take on everyone they disagree with and being snarky about it. Um, that's what happens. And so when we're reading the Gospels, we're getting MSNBC on the Pharisees or Fox on the Pharisees. We're getting the extreme characterization for really purposes that aren't ours in the modern world and don't, don't match the history of the period as best we can tell. Thank you. I want to remind everyone that you can continue to ask your questions in the chat and there's some good conversation happening there as well if you want to pay attention to that. We have a question from Pastor Noe who said he's learning Hebrew and is wondering, Rabbi, what you might suggest for those who are learning Hebrew and how they should read it. Is there a method or books or stories that would best influence that reading? No, I'm sorry, just clarify. Are you talking about learning the Hebrew or applying the Hebrew you've learned to reading the text? So I, I was I was reading Genesis 1 or Psalm 23 or just verses that I know from the Old Testament because they're familiar in English. But is there like a method that you teach to your, in, in the synagogue, like should you do it from Genesis all the way to, to the end or how, what's your advice on where to start or where to finish? Um, for us, Torah is, again, at the core. Uh, I think someone, uh, Dr. Lovelace, I think, referred earlier to kind of the rhythm in which Jews read uh, Torah. Uh, we read Torah in its entirety every single year. From the beginning of Genesis through the end of Deuteronomy, the minute we're done, we start over again. Uh, so to begin to deal with this, uh, starting with Torah and reading it sequentially uh, makes the most sense from a Jewish perspective. When I talk about the Hebrew, understand that Jews can't even agree with what the very first word says. Bereshit is usually translated in the beginning, except grammatically that can't be what it says. So some suggest it means when God began to create. By the way, in the beginning, not only doesn't work grammatically, it doesn't work theologically. In the beginning of what? 
If God is eternal, there's no beginning. So uh, I would definitely start with Torah. Now, the rest of the Tanakh, the rest of the Hebrew Bible, we do read in different ways. Dr. Lovelace referred to uh, the five scrolls that we read on different holidays. So last, uh, last weekend, we read Song of Songs for Passover. Uh, we will read Ruth on the Jewish holiday of Shavuot, which uh, comes very loosely into Christianity as Pentecost. Uh, we will read Lamentations on Tisha B'Av. Uh, that doesn't make the Hallmark reading card calendars. Uh, Tisha B'Av is the day when we remember the destruction of both the first and second, se second temples. We read Ecclesiastes on Sukkot or Tabernacles. We read Esther on Purim. We read Jonah on Yom Kippur. And we talked earlier about Abraham praying with uh, or offering sacrifices with people outside of his tribe. If you look at the book of Jonah, the heroes of the story are non-Jews. They're the sailors on the boat who say, no, 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 we're not going to throw you overboard. They're the people of Nineveh who, despite Jonah's great hope that they'll be punished, they actually repent. Those are the books we read in their entirety. We do cherry pick from the prophets. We cherry pick from the Psalms. But Torah is the one from beginning to end that uh, becomes the starting point for everything for us. Great, we have another question from Liz. And um, Dean Lovelace, maybe you can give some more response to this one. The question is, any insight into how Jewish children were treated or included that Jesus needed to remind the disciples to not prevent them from coming near? That was actually directed to Rabbi <laughs> Pascal, but um, uh, the article um, that I mentioned um, does deal with how um, recognizing, it, it, it recognizes as kind of a gender inclusive. I don't want to get into, um, and I don't think the article makes Jesus out to be a feminist, um, or it, which is one of the complaints um, that um, often comes up um, in the, um, that Jesus not like the other men, not like other Jewish men. You know, he's more inclusive and accepting of women. But um, in that it's the women, it's the mothers who brought the children uh, to Jesus and that um, in Jesus teaching of the importance or the significance of having a, you know, when we think of children as being more um, accepting of others more, I don't want to say, you know, manageable um, in terms of, uh, the, the children just tend to be more open. Um, and so coming um, before, having an attitude of um, like a child. And so uh, Jesus is chastising um, those who are, um, again, I'm, I'm trying not to give it this, um, and uh, the anti-Jewish uh, reading of the text that um, they, that they, you know, in terms of the hierarchy that children are on the, the lowest, um, because children are very much welcomed um, in the Jewish tradition and are important, um, but just having that um, childlike mind is important in terms of um, and, and Jesus teaching in this context for being open to um, what Jesus is trying to teach them um, in that moment. Great, thank you for that insight. Uh, Rabbi Jack, do you want to add anything to that? You know, it's children are essential in Jewish life and have been. Uh, when we observed Passover a couple of weeks ago, um, the Passover Seder experience, the ceremonial meal, depends on children asking questions. It's not something of children should be seen but not heard. We need to hear the children. 
So I don't know the context within Christian scripture as to where this appears and why it appears. Uh, but I do know that it doesn't seem in keeping with my understanding of Jewish tradition now or 2000 years ago. So I'd have to explore that in a little more detail to try to understand the context. Are, they, uh, are there any other questions? Yes, I do have one. Well, uh, okay, Rabbi uh, Paskov. One thing that uh, almost blew my mind when I started reading, uh, well, actually learning about the Old Testament in our Old Testament classes, the Old Testament uh, and even our professors did not, well, let's just say they were not concerned about uh, conflict, conflicting stories in the Old Testament. And to me, perhaps it's, you know, the baggage I bring in as a Christian. I could not understand it. And I asked many questions, uh, perhaps too many questions. How, how, do you, how, how do you explain that? How do you deal with it? I know you said uh, you don't take uh, the Old Testament literally, but there are conflicting stories. And outside of me, nobody's bothered by it. <laughs> uh, conflicting stories, like two creation stories, two Noah stories, is that what you- Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, we're not bothered by it either. <laughs> Now, let me, let me clarify that, um, because you're, you're coming from one of two places in Jewish life. You're either coming from the place where it's there, God is perfect, God put it there for a reason, or we're coming from a place that says, don't try to read it literally anyway. I often find that uh, the texts come along to answer different questions uh, Genesis chapter one is a sequential telling of the creation story. Genesis chapter two introduces a relationship between humans and God, an obligation for the earth. So there are two very different agendas, how the stories play out uh, as narrative units and the fact that you can have two kind of smashed up against each other, that doesn't bother me uh, because especially as a reformed Jew, I have no problem saying J, E, P, and D and uh, a bunch of others along with them probably with a rather heavy handed redactor. Uh, uh, the one that we do play with a lot is the two different versions of the 10 commandments. So are we remembering the Sabbath day or are we observing the Sabbath day? And we get around that uh, in a kind of interesting way. Uh, on Friday night when we welcome the Sabbath, we sing a song called L'cha Dodi. Uh, we're welcoming the Sabbath as a bride, metaphorically. And one of the verses says, Shamor v'zachor b'dibur echad. Uh, it says, observe and remember God spoke in a single breath, in a single utterance. As a reformed Jew, I say, okay, nice, cute, but it's largely an irrelevant issue um, unless you're trying to peel away, was this J, was it E, who, who actually said it, uh, which there are certainly scholars who do that. And just Dude, I would add, Dean, maybe uh, we'll go first. Oh, I was going to say what I when I'm teaching, what I add to that um, again. One of the things that I say attracted me to becoming a Hebrew Bible scholar is the the multiple voices that the editors chose not to. I mean, certainly as we would say in you know, a film context, there's you know, a film that got cut and left on the floor. But the idea that one tradition didn't privilege another, um, that they chose to be inclusive of these various traditions, um, especially when we think about um, 
the received tradition and when we talk about um, when the uh, northern uh, kingdom was destroyed and they were the people would disperse they went south to Judah and carried these traditions with them then you know then the, um, the um, Judah tradition the southern tradition um, would be privileged but instead of privileging and saying this is our tradition and we because we're I wouldn't say the winners, but we're the ones who survive, then we're going to privilege um, our version that they included both stories. Um, and so you have um, the story that's um, attributed to Israel in the North and you have the story that's attributed to Judah in the South. And so those minority voices, those disparate voices um, are included and to make that decision, I think is one of the beauties of the Hebrew Bible. I was going to observe that, you know, very often when seminarians encounter academic biblical scholarship for the first time, they think, why did I get this crazy professor? And to, to note that Rabbi Paskoff was taught Hebrew Bible in ways not that dissimilar from ways Dean Loveless and I were taught Hebrew Bible. Um, a lot of the same questions, a lot of the same categories a lot of the same information. Um, academic biblical studies ask these questions. And, um, you know, Dean Loveless and I went to different seminaries and different graduate programs. So it's not that we all agree about everything. If we did, we wouldn't get paid, but we, we have common frameworks for talking about these things. And one that Dean Loveless was just talking about is we embrace the diversity within the Bible. Um, in the second century, an early Christian named Tatian tried to crunch the four Gospels into one story that made chronological sense and didn't have any contradictions. And, you know, short version of the story, because I don't know the long one, is the church said, we don't need that. We'd prefer four. Thank you. Uh, and I wonder if we could internalize that, which is generally more comfortable in the rabbinic tradition, to internalize um, that there are diversity of perspectives, even within the scriptures, um, that could be a model for how we deal with diversity am among ourselves. Okay. Uh, Jen, if you uh, don't have a question. Dr. Shemekin has his hand up. Oh, thank you. Um, with regard to the uh, controversies and arguments in the Gospels, um, would it be helpful, instead of viewing these as um, Jewish Christian quarrels, uh, to instead see them as uh, quarrels about the human condition? Um, and I say that against the background that every branch of Christianity has had uh, examples of uh, extremely rigid legalism. Um, so that um, it, it, it seems to me there's a basis for suggesting that some of these controversies in the Gospels is not a split between uh, Jesus and Jews, but uh, it, it's a controversy between humans. Could I maybe respond to that a little sideways and see if Peter will take it? What? Uh, if, if you'll accept my going a little sideways with the answer. Yeah. Um, so one of the first things to think about is within the world of the Bible, yeah. Judaism is not a world religion because there are no world religions, right? Yeah. Every people group has their own traditions and the Romans called it religion. And so, okay. Yeah. So there are no, during the New Testament, there are no debates between Christians, which also didn't exist as a world religion. Right. And Judaism. You know, Christianity is living in some kind of relationship with synagogues, sometimes intense conflict and sometimes not. 
So I think you're right that it's it's not that to make it a, a Christian versus Jew thing. And I think you're right to observe that conflict is a human matter and we do it too as Christians and see it that way. The only thing I would add is a lot of the things that we say about Judaism really come from conflicts between Catholics and Protestants. And so what Protestants started doing was taking their complaints about Catholics and pinning them on Jews. Uh, Jonathan Z. Smith has a brilliant book about this. Uh, he died, I think, last year, called Drudgery Divine, about that work of comparison. Um, and so that's really the core of it. This, this stuff doesn't go back to the New Testament nearly as much as it goes back to the 16th and 17th centuries, I think, among Christians. You know, we haven't talked a lot about the synthesis between our understanding of scripture and history. And I think there's an important piece to add to this conversation. Judaism and early rabbinic Judaism and early Christianity grow up side by side, responding to the exact same historical circumstances in the exact same region. We get into some of these issues when we start politicizing these different groups. Now, I, I don't mean politicizing yet, even with Constantine, then it becomes a real problem. Right? But much earlier than that, we start defining who's in and who's out. We all do it. And once we start doing that, we're going to find ways to identify who's part of my group. I shared recently, we have a document called Pir Kavod. It's part of the Mishnah. And it talks about different miracles that happened in Jerusalem. And one of the miracles was, according to Jewish tradition, that even at the time of the pilgrimage holidays, they never ran out of room in Jerusalem, right? Well, if I'm just reading that without understanding Christian history and there was no room at the inn, it looks okay, fine, it's innocuous. But when I put early Christianity and Judaism side by side, I say, oh, okay, we're responding to something here. And we do respond to each other. And so what started up growing side by side eventually got pulled apart. And that hits its peak with Constantine and only grows from there. Early on, I don't know that these conflicts existed in the same way we think of them today. Eventually, we get to defining who's in and who's out. Do we have uh, one last question? Short one. We have four more minutes, so I'm going to take advantage of that. Go ahead, Dr. Williams. I, it, it's on the tip of your tongue. <laughs> Well, let me, let me ask uh, Dr. Carey. We're obviously we're Christians. So this is a Christian seminary. So we went through almost 90 minutes of this. How should we, uh, for lack of a better word, take the leap from the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, to the New Testament and actually make it work the right way? Are you sure you want to ask me and not Dean Loveless? <clears throat> Whoever uh, is willing to answer that. Only because she gets paid to answer that question. <laughs> well, she just came back from her mini uh, vacation. <laughs> How do we make the leap? 
I, well, I, th I think what I mentioned earlier when I started with what I think is important when we look at the arrangement and that the Old Testament arrangement is not the same as the Jewish arrangement of the text and that we should keep in mind that the prophets, that, that Jesus isn't everywhere um, and that the whole purpose of the Old Testament Hebrew Bible is not about Jesus. Um, there's the tradition that when Jesus, I mean, when Jesus, when, uh, when God in uh, Genesis 1 says, let us uh, make the human, um, that that's, the, that's God, um, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. It's the Trinity. Um, and, you know, it just goes from there that, you know, throughout in certain interpretations that Jesus is everywhere. And to recognize that in that time, in when we talk about prophecies, for example, and pointing to Jesus, that those prophecies were intended to be fulfilled and understood in the lifetime of the readers. And so they're not pointing to thousands of years later, but they're pointing to when it, within that lifetime. And so to, as we move forward from there and remembering that again, this is a, a lived tradition that is um, alive today, um, that Judaism still exists and, uh, and Jewish readers are reading these texts um, each week uh, for how to understand um, how they be in relationship with God and with one another and doing with um, all of the uh, creation that moving into the New Testament, one, to remember that there are those texts in between, what we call the deuterocanonical texts, um, that we don't leap from Malachi to Matthew, uh, that there are, are these other uh, Jewish writings in Greek um, that may not be canonical in any rabbinic tradition, but nonetheless, there are these other texts that are still a continuity um, that gets into from, as we've moved from Assyria domination and then uh, Babylonian and um, Persian and Greek, and then we get into the Roman. Um, you know, so that there's this constant movement of conflict and reimagining and remaking oneself as a people in light of their understanding of who God is and their relationship to God. Um, that moves into the New Testament. And so that is how I would encourage people to leap from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We'll leave it at that then. Thank you so much. Uh, where the SEC is very, very grateful for Rabbi Paskov, Dean Lovelies, and uh, Dr. Carey for uh, taking their time to share their expertise with us. Thank you to the seminary, the staff and the professors for allowing us to do this for the LTS uh, community. And thank you most of all to the students, the cl uh, our classmates for giving us your complete confidence and trust to work on events such as these. Now, if you will allow me, I'll put in a short plug for the SEC. The SEC is made up of students that love the, you know, the, the seminary and the community that it actually provides for us. Please continue to support it. And more importantly, please participate in it. And you can do that by joining the SSE itself or even volunteering for the many uh, events that it uh, supports and uh, uh, allows uh, to happen. Well, thank you everyone. Uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you.